I'm Heidi Henderson, the Fossil Huntress, and your host for BC's Fossil Bounty. Join in the exploration of the fascinating science of paleontology, that lens that examines ancient animals, plants, and ecosystems, from wee single-cell organisms to big and mighty dinosaurs. My name's Andy Randall, and I'm a professional geoscientist living here in Vancouver in southern BC. And I'm really pleased to be talking to you today about our rich fossil history that we have in British Columbia. I deal with minerals, but I have a huge interest in fossils that stuck with me since being a kid growing up on the south coast of the Isle of Wight. And so it's been a fascinating journey for me to move through British Columbia and actually see a lot of these things in person and collect in new areas. Hopefully I can inspire you as well to get out there and keep exploring. Meet Andy Randall, a professional geologist living in Vancouver who is tailoring his career to bring change to the minerals exploration industry. He's on a mission to evolve geology and to share his technical knowledge and encourage business practices within the mining sector to embrace sustainability principles. Practices that include working with local communities to ensure that the environmental footprint of this important industry meet very specific goals. Minimizing land disturbance and waste production, preventing soil, water and air pollution at mine sites, and only moving projects forward that can meet these goals from the onset. Back in the UK where we could go for walks on the beach and pick up fossils at the low tide, anything from dinosaur bones through to marine shells, anything would fascinate me. If it was old and it was dead, I was into it. I would bring these fossils home with me and study them and clean them up. As I got older, I'd know which books to get from the library to get the names of the species and then which species lived in which beds. And that would really bring to me the story of the rocks. So as we move through the rock layers, what was the environment telling me? So moving to Canada back in 2000, 2004, I was opened up to a whole new level of geology and experiences that we could have here. The giant mountains that we don't see in the UK, the age of the rocks that we have here. The life of a geologist is, is really something that is quite exhilarating. As I've got older, I've decided to specialize a little bit more, concentrating more within areas such as British Columbia and Yukon for my career, because it's nice to kind of get really intimate with some of the surroundings that we live in and get to know those rocks inside out and become an expert. As a mineral guy, working for companies to go out there and find minerals such as copper, gold, silver, molybdenum, all these things that we can find in British Columbia. A lot of people kind of get funny with mining when I talk in Vancouver. It's a very distant subject. People don't necessarily equate where their iPhone came from to mining. All over the world, these operations are going on to remove the minerals to keep up with public demand. And that's not just the everyday items that we have, but that's also moving over to our green economy. So as we want to drive electric cars, as we want to use alternative fuel sources, even if we want to build wind farms, we're having to find different sources of metals and things that we're not used to exploring for. Rare earth minerals, things like neodymium and things like that, that I wouldn't have heard of two years ago, but now we look for in our assays when we're measuring rock samples from the field. I pride myself on what I do in that I work in a very regulated environment. We have a lot of environmental regulations. We have a lot of hoops that we have to jump through. And within our industry, we're affecting the change to make it almost harder on ourselves every year. Especially as younger generations come in, they want to see a much more green outcome, a much more sustainable outcome to what we're doing. So working with communities, working with the ground itself, we are able to produce a mineral pipeline. You know, the end product that everybody's used to is a mine that produces metals that then goes into our everyday items, such as 
cars and tin cans and the TV equipment, the cameras that I'm talking to you through right now. But the pipeline starts very early with exploration and that's what I do is I go into the field, hike up and down a mountain with some clues behind me of the rock types and what could be prospective layers and I'll be looking for certain minerals. Often I'm tasked with gold, people like gold, but I'm much more interested, I must admit, in silver, lead, zinc, those kind of minerals. I just find them much more interesting to look for. You can go out and you can prospect and you can look for rock samples, send it to the lab and it comes back with some fantastic grades. But that might just be that one rock. That doesn't mean to say that that area that I'm hunting in is actually going to become a mine. Only about one in 10,000 sites that ever get looked at become a mine. That's the general statistics all over the world. And there's a lot of things that can block that. It's not just the presence of the minerals. There's been some great sites that I've walked away from that have had a lot of potential, but it's been in an environmentally sensitive area or local communities that have said, hey, you know what? There's actually, we rely on tourism in this area and we'll step back, that's fine. There's other places that we can go. So working with communities, working with the environment, working with First Nations, it's all very, very integral to what we do. And I find now as my role as a geologist, probably only about 10% of my time is spent in the field doing that field work. The rest of the time is spent with me working through environmental permits, talking to First Nations groups and all those things that come together to actually make an exploration project. So if you hear the word mine or exploration project, you can't instantly assume that it's going to become something that's going to be a big hole in the backyard that's going to be producing dust and noise and be a bad thing for the planet. But uh, there's a lot of checks in place that we're developing to keep those things sustainable, keep them green and and to really protect the environment and the people that live out there and all things that are critical to our future as a human race. So one of the great things that I found working as an exploration geologist is the ability to travel. Been to some really exotic places. In my career, I've managed to work in Africa. I've worked across Europe, worked in North America and South America and seen some fantastic places, fantastic people, fantastic experiences all around. My first job was I got flown through Barbados and had to stay for 24 hours on a beach resort for my connecting flight. That's fantastic. When you're in your 20s and to be able to get to do that and get paid for it it's, it's pretty impressive as i've gone on as i say like i've got more and more settled within bc yukon those areas i've built friendships up with local people and i've kind of got an affinity for the rocks that we see one of my favorite places to go is out towards Cranbrook and that area around there where we've got a lot of different fossils from different ages. There's the Eagle Creek Formation, there's the Bull River Formation where we find some fantastic fish fossils, there's some 540 million year old shell beds that are turning up new species all the time. Just last November I was out there and was being shown some new species of brachiopods that haven't been described yet. When I'm out doing mineral exploration, being able to tie in my love of paleontology as well, the crossovers are fantastic. And that's what makes me enthusiastic to come to work every day and seeing all these different projects that I can review because I can go out there and I can make a discovery and it could be mineral, it could be fossil. I don't mind. It's something that I just love to do. I love being out there and I love to explore. Drop me off in a helicopter on the side of a mountain and leave me there for the day just to putz around. Fantastic. Would never see me doing any other job besides this. The fossils we find along the Kitsilano foreshore record fossil forest fires from 40 million years ago. Plant fossils are common in these beds and are often well preserved. They record a time when we lived in a much warmer, wetter world. What is most interesting about the Kitsilano fossils is not what we see, but it's what we don't see. Because none of the animals are there, we only find the plant species. So when I'm back at home in Vancouver, I still don't really switch off that geologist brain. It's always going in my head. I've got two dogs, love walking with me. They come to the field with me as well, but they're both swimmers. They love to get down by the beach. And so one of my favorite places to take them is here in Kitsilano, just down downtown Vancouver, just a 10 minute bus ride away. I've been coming down there for a few years. And I remember when I first moved to Vancouver, I read a paper on the geology of Vancouver and there was one image of a fossil leaf and a little, paragraph that said Eocene leaf fossil found at Dunbar Street steps and that was it. Eocene that's a time period that was about 40 million years ago 45 million years ago and so that's the age of the rocks down there they actually straddles two periods Eocene or the Oligocene. I went down there and I had a look went to the bottom of the Dunbar Street steps and the dogs are running around having a lot of fun and there was some boulders that had fallen out the cliff some sandstone boulders that were pretty loose and they'd smashed open well, I was like, okay I'll have a look around and sure enough I split these rocks open 
and there were fossil leaves inside of them. And I was blown away as a paleontologist living in a downtown city core to have something that I could go recreationally walk to with my dogs and kill two birds with one stone, exercise them and satisfy my curiosity was absolutely amazing. So I started to study that section of beach. I'd sometimes have students with me. I'd sometimes drag my partner along with me. We'd walk along the beach and we started to map it. We started to collect samples from different places. And what we found was this, this really dynamic environment that was preserved in these rocks from 40, 45 million years ago that has giant river channels through it. You can see evidence of storms, you can find evidence of lightning strikes that hit the forest back then. But most of all, these layers and layers of exceptionally preserved leaves. That's 500 million years ago, something to preserve that delicate is exceptional. So when we come here to Kitsilano and we see these fossilized leaves that are in near perfect condition, you have to think again about how exceptional that preservational environment is. We see all these different species of leaf fossils building up in layers on the beaches there. A lot of those species would be recognizable today. So species of oak, for example, or hazelnuts, willows, etc. So we found the leaves, we find the catkins, the seeds, all those kind of things preserved in there as well. If we go through a process called maceration, where we break the rocks up in acid and then put the residue under the microscope we'll even find the pollen from the species there and generally we'll find more pollen for more species than we do find the fossil leaves but that means that those plants were there at that time we can also get really specific about the environment that these were living in not just from the sediments but also from the plants themselves and we find sometimes at the lower levels we get these big sequoias fossils that we're getting in there they lived in much more kind of humid environment kind of swampy kind of environment like the everglades would be today in florida Florida. And as we move up through the sequence of rocks there, it becomes a drier environment and the plants get replaced by the oaks and everything that you will almost see today. It would be like walking through Stanley Park. So a very kind of interesting tale of climate change that was happening 40, 45 million years ago. And we can study things like that to understand the climate change and the impacts that we see happening on the planet today. So this is one of the spots where you can collect fossils from here on the beach. And what you'll see is we're on this kind of little ridge that's sticking up on, on, the, on the foreshore here. And as the waves come in, they're crashing into here and they're eroding this part out. So when you find these places like this, you can sometimes find loose bits of rock around. And if you turn them over and have a look, quite often you'll find the fossil leaves in them. Welcome to the Kitsilano foreshore. I'm excited to bring you down here and show you some of the rocks and some of the exciting things that I've seen over the years. We're gonna look at some different outcrops. I'll explain what they mean as well and how the setting in the environment. What I've brought along with me today, I've got my hammer, which is an essential geologist tool, and I've brought myself some rolls of newspaper with me and some plastic bags, so if I do find anything, I can put them in there. And I've also got a chisel, which will just help me bring some of the rocks out the ground and help leverage them if we find anything. Now, what I will say is that collecting, you have to be careful when you're collecting. You can't just go ahead and destroy outcrops, everything like that. Be very specific with what you're looking at. It's always best to collect material that's already loose as opposed to digging things out the ground. And the newspaper is very important as well because one thing with these fossils and a lot of other fossils that we find, they're coming out the ground and they're wet. Now, if you dry them out, you allow them to dry straight away, they'll actually crack and crumble. And by the time you get them home, they'll just be a bag of dust. So we wrap them in newspaper and then that way we let them dry out very, very slowly. And that preserves the fossils really well for you. See some, some more of the samples that we found here before. And you can see I've dried these out to preserve them. Um, and you get a nice contrast between the leaf, then the dark and the, the light gray sediment there. But these are pretty big leaves. Um, this is probably a type of birch leaf in here as well. This type of um, sycamore leaves as well. Kitsilano is an open public place. It's beautiful to get to. You'll see a lot of people on the beach there. You have respect for anybody that's walking their dogs or anybody else that's using the beach as well. And obviously you have a lot of people that live along the tops there. So when you come down, enjoy the beach take only what you can that's loose if you do take anything but just enjoy it and leave things for other people to find as well. Exploration mining has often had Andy recreationally fossil collecting. His work has him in close proximity to some of the best fossil exposures in British Columbia and the world including those beautiful Cambrian outcrops in the Kootenai region. Here, trilobites like Olinellus ricei and their big, bruising, larger cousins, the Winaria, are found alongside weird and wonderful arthropods like Tozoya and Anomalocaris, with designs so unusual it looks like evolution rushed a deadline.
So I did bring along some fossils with me just to show off. I'm gonna show you some of the fossils from Kitsilano that we've got right here. This one's my favorite. Doesn't look like much, but you can see the leaves uh, in here. They're really well preserved, these dark brown leaves. They look like they could have just fallen down yesterday into the mud and been pressed in there. But what's really special about this specimen is just these little tiny holes that you can see here. It's actually these little kind of dots along the leaves. And these are tiny little leaf mines that were made by insects that were eating these leaves when they grew. That were probably left by a caterpillar or some kind of insect that was foraging on these leaves when they were up in the tree before they fell into the water and were preserved. To be able to get this kind of preservation of a leaf, there's not a lot of rotting that's going on. They've obviously been buried very quickly. The sediment has provided all the really, really fine detail. And just the fact that we're in a very productive forest area that can have all these types of leaves and seeds and everything like that. There's water flowing. We've never found any animal fossils there. So there's no beetles, there's no snails, there's no fish, there's no insects. All the things that would be typical of a site like this anywhere else in the world. Now I've worked on sites from this age in Germany and we found fossilized butterflies in there. We would find crocodiles in there with these leaves. We would find tadpoles, all these different things from different times, all stuck together in these rocks and preserved perfectly. This is the big mystery with this. I'm hoping I'm gonna find some animal remains in here soon. So we've got the trace fossils, so we know that they're there, but where's the actual body fossil of the animal? Maybe you could be the first person to find one there. That would be really exciting. So this is another one of my pieces that I've collected at the, at the Kitts Beach. It's not very big, as you can see. It's got the leaves on this side again. And these are types of older leaves. There's some oak leaves in here as well. So things, again, that we would see as we're just walking around, even in Kitsilano, around the streets, you'd see these trees growing these days. But these, again, are 40, 45 million years old. Now, if I turn this rock over, there's not many leaves on the backside of this one. But what's really interesting is it's actually totally different species. Now, if you remember, I was talking about these swamp cypress that were growing, these big taxodium trees, they were called, very similar to what we find in Florida. So on the side of this here, you can see there's these little remains of those taxodium species. So a taxodium is a type of tree that we call a swamp cypress. And you'll be familiar with them if you ever look at pictures of the Florida Everglades, the really big tall trees that grow in the swamps there with their roots in the water. And that means that the rock was building up this way. So the taxodium was living here in a warm, wet environment. But in the time that this has gone on, the speciation has changed, the climate's changed. So those taxodium have more but disappeared and been replaced by these much drier, cooler climate species like the oaks and the alders that we have here. One of my favorites that I've actually collected in the Cranbrook area, behind the gun range, funny enough, you don't have to go far off the track to find these fossils. These are from the Eager Creek Formation at the Cambrian Age. So I'm gonna show you this guy here. Doesn't look like much, but this little slab, there's some dimples along here, and it's actually a trackway that was made by a trilobite that lived at the bottom of the ocean during that time. Now this is a what we call a, an ichnofossil. This is a trace fossil. So it's not the actual animal itself, but it's the trackways that this animal made. So here's our little trilobite. This guy here, a little segmented thing, kind of looked like a crab or like a giant wood louse. And it would have just been going along the seafloor, going along, eating, stuffing through the mud as it went, trying to avoid predators that were there. And it left its little trackways in the mud. Now what's fascinating about this is something at the bottom of the sea that's moving all the time. This must have got buried very quickly in very fine sediments to be able to preserve this. Something to be able to last 500 million years uh, in the rocks and have everything happen to them that happens to them for me to go and pick out like this is really special. When you break a rock open and you're the first person to see this, it's a really, really fantastic moment in time. Obviously, I'm very passionate about what I do and not everybody shares that passion, but one thing I can normally connect with people on when you talk to them is childhood. Were you into dinosaurs? Most people were. Most people like dinosaurs. Doesn't matter if you're a boy or a girl, they're into dinosaurs at some point in their lives. And I find that bringing that conversation up again sparks that interest. And you know, you, you can find adults that, uh, that get into it. We've done these lectures and we've done these field trips and parents have brought their kids along. And then, you know, assuming it's gonna be educational for the kids, but then it's the parents, especially when it gets hands on, that get really into it. So did you give somebody a hammer and say, hey, look, if you break this rock open, you might find a leaf fossil, you might find a trilobite, you might find an ammonite. That hunt, 
That curiosity is something that's deep inside every single one of us. So although you might not want to go home and build a giant collection of fossils, going out there and actually on a walk and finding something yourself is a real thrill. If you're the first person to ever see that, think about all the history that's happened, all of human history, all of evolution, all of the planetary history, where that rock has sat silently in the ground waiting for you to come along and pick it up that day. I think that's pretty incredible. And he continues his work taking on new graduate geoscientists and mentoring them through a variety of exploration projects to help educate, engage, and build the next generation of geologists. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode of BC's Fossil Bounty. I'm Heidi Henderson, the Fossil Huntress. <laughs>